I'm Nima Rajan. Only 30 members of Canada's Olympic delegation took part in today's opening ceremony at the Tokyo Games. That's because of strict COVID-19 protocols at the Olympic Village. The ceremony will also be largely spectator-free, with only a handful of officials, guests and members of the media filling seats at Tokyo's Olympic Stadium. British Columbia's Emergency Coordination Agency is working to expand its use of a public alert system. Alert Ready is a Canada-wide system allowing government officials to issue public safety alerts through major television and radio broadcasters, as well as wireless devices, and is already used for tsunami threats and amber alerts. Emergency Management BC says the system is being looked at for a variety of hazards, although it's not known if it would be in place for this wildfire season. Some help is on the way for farmers and ranchers dealing with this year's drought. Federal Agriculture Minister Marie-Claude Bebeau toured Manitoba's Interlake region yesterday to see the effect of drought on agriculture producers. Ottawa is working closely with the provinces to quickly respond. We received the initial request from five provinces to start the process of putting together an agri-recovery disaster relief program. Federal and provincial officials are now working together to do the assessments and design those programs province by province. The measures she has announced include early designation of a livestock tax deferral provision. The Canadian Security Intelligence Service is out with a warning. CSIS says it is seeing steady and in some cases increasing foreign interference and sophisticated state-sponsored activity targeting elections. The government agency says social media is being leveraged to spread disinformation or run foreign-influenced campaigns designed to confuse or divide public opinion or interfere in healthy public debate. Green leader Annie Paul is seeking to frame a legal challenge from her own party as the work of a small group. As she opened her campaign office in downtown Toronto today, Ms. Paul said the court action was not sanctioned by the Greens' main governing body. The continued turmoil inside the Green Party comes as it and other federal parties prepare for what many expect will be a federal election call as early as next month. The military officer who was vaccine rollout boss says his reputation has been, quote, irreparably tarnished by the government's decision to abruptly replace him. Major General Danny Fortin's assertion is contained in an affidavit as part of his legal battle to reverse his dismissal from the Public Health Agency of Canada. He alleges his firing was improper and politically motivated. General Fortin was removed just five days before the Canadian Forces National Investigation Service referred a sexual misconduct investigation to the Quebec Prosecution Service to determine whether criminal charges should be laid. House of Commons Speaker Anthony Rhoda says the federal government is interfering with exclusive jurisdiction of the House in its attempt to shield documents related to the firing of two scientists. Last month, the Liberal government asked the federal court to prohibit disclosure of records concerning the dismissal of two scientists from Canada's highest security laboratory. In a notice of motion filed yesterday, Speaker Rhoda says pursuant to its parliamentary privileges, the House of Commons has the power to send for the persons, papers and records it deems necessary to its functions. Well, newly released briefing notes indicate Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan told the military to create a position eventually filled by a reserve officer from his old unit. Major Greg McCullough has been suspended from the Vancouver Police Service for an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate. This comes with lingering questions over how and why Major McCullough ended up with the unique position before his removal last month. He was hired to support Minister Sajjan in March 2020, despite being found guilty in 2018 of two counts of misconduct for his relationship with Constable Nicole Chan. She died by suicide on January 2019. Retail numbers for May 2021 were released this morning by Statistics Canada. According to the agency, retail sales fell 2.1% to $53.8 billion in May. In April, retail sales fell 5.7% to $54.8 billion. A grant-making program has been introduced to honour late Jeopardy! host Alex Trebek, who would have been 81 yesterday. To mark his birthday, the Trebek Initiative was created to support and empower emerging Canadian explorers, scientists, educators and photographers. The Greater Sudbury native had a passion for geographic literacy and served as honorary president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society until his passing. The program will provide more than $400,000 annually to emerging Canadian explorers. 
All right, stay with us as we take a deeper look into anti-Semitism in Canada and what can be done to tackle hate in the country. We'll have an interview with Michael Molston, the CEO of B'nai B'rith Canada, up next. And of course, more news from around the world, only on Forum Daily. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after some short messages. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, federal ministers, opposition critics, premiers and mayors participated in a national summit on anti-Semitism on Wednesday, along with Jewish community members from across the country. Diversity Minister Bardish Chagger says the summit allows community members to speak directly with politicians to express their concerns and ideas on combating anti-Semitism. B'nai B'rith Canada, a Jewish human rights organization, says it recorded over 2,600 anti-Semitic incidents just last year. B'nai B'rith says it also made a list of strong, action-based recommendations for government to implement. And to tell us more about these recommendations, we are joined by Michael Moston, CEO of B'nai B'rith Canada. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Thank you so much for having me on today. Now, how prominent is anti-Semitic sentiment in Canada, sir? Unfortunately, it's out there. Uh, they say that it's the world's oldest uh, virus and uh, it's been around for thousands of years. It is present in Canada just the way that it is present all the way around the globe. And um, as you just mentioned, uh, B'nai has been putting out an audit of anti-Semitic incidents since 1982. And we have been showing for the past five years um, a real growth, um, over 2,000 incidents in Canada uh, for the last three years. Um, this is a problem that we need to address as a society because anti-Semitism is at the end of the day is it is a virus, it is a unique form, a unique manifestation of racism that Yes, it impacts the Jewish community, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a plague that uh, destroys democracy. Now, as you mentioned, uh, B'nai B'rith says it recorded over 2,000 incidents of anti-Semitism in Canada just last year. So can you tell us a little bit about the extent of these incidents and how victims have been impacted? Absolutely. So these could be, it's a wide range. It could be on university campuses, um, in the workplace, at home. Uh, they could be vandalism, acts of violence, um, acts of harassment. And the harassment growing, unfortunately, the trend is online. Uh, that's where a lot of us have spent our time, particularly during uh, these COVID-19 uh, years at this point. Um, but there's been a, even a greater explosion this past year during the Hamas conflict. In the month of May alone, there were 61 acts of violence against the Jewish community. And to put that into perspective, last year, where there were approximately 2,600 incidents over all of anti-Semitism, there were only about nine incidents of violence. So there was an explosive growth. And one of the things that we mentioned at the summit uh, dealing with anti-Semitism our government held this past week was to recognize that, yes, there is a problem in the growth of anti-Semitism from the extreme right, from white supremacists and from neo-Nazis. Um, but it's also the ma manifestations of anti-Semitism we saw in Canada, on the streets of Canada, all across uh, the country uh, was in anti-Zionist rhetoric and uh, the singling out of the state of Israel. And unfortunately, that expressed itself, turned itself into violence attacking Jews. And we know B'nai B'rith released uh, some recommendations for officials to consider in tackling anti-Semitism in Canada. Uh, can you go over these recommendations for us, sir? We've got about two minutes left. Sure. So we sort of put it into four different baskets. The first basket is actually combating anti-Semitism, mainstreaming the fight, making sure that we have hate crime units across the country, properly trained um, and, and dealing with victim support, um, highlighting uh, the need to combat anti-Semitism, not just domestically here in Canada, but internationally as well. We should not be financing uh, anti-Semitism um, through uh, our international aid agencies, giving grants to organizations in Canada uh, that, um, for example, don't support the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, then we want to foster Jewish life as well. It's not just good enough to say we're going to fight against racism, we're going to fight against anti-Semitism in this case. We have to embrace the Jewish community as we should all communities and say, you're welcome here in Canada. We're not interested in just creating some sort of a safe space for you. This whole country needs to be a safe space for all of us and violence and harassment is not welcome at any identifiable group in this country. The next basket was about 
preserving Holocaust remembrance. Um, we need to learn from the universal lessons of the Holocaust. Unfortunately, there are still those that deny it or justify it. Um, it that's, that's just wrong. And, and that's a matter of um, uh, education, educating our youth, our, our youth to, to respect other human beings. And, but the bottom line, and, and perhaps the most important, is creating follow-up mechanisms and processes. It's important that the government held a summit on anti-Semitism. It's important as an acknowledgement uh, of the fact, but uh, that's just not good enough. We need action. Um, and so we're looking to our federal government um, to show leadership in the struggle against anti-Semitism. And, um, and that at the end of the day will show whether or not this is, is a success. What steps are we making in a country, as a country uh, to, uh, to deal with this issue? All right, Mr. Mostyn, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. The executive director of BC Wildfire Service says drought and water shortages are aggravating BC's fire situation. Ian Meyer says most of the water shortages are affecting the southern half of the province due to little or no rain over the past five weeks, and none in the forecast. However, he says the water scarcity is not yet compromising firefighting efforts. Police in Vancouver say there has been a dramatic increase in the number of vandalism or mischief cases against properties owned by churches. Police say they are worried that somebody will get hurt. The cases correlate with the discovery of what are believed to be unmarked graves outside a former residential school in Kamloops and elsewhere in Canada. The schools were mainly run by the Catholic Church. A second Alberta First Nation wants a court to allow it to appeal a review board's decision that ruled an open pit coal mine in the Rocky Mountains is not in the public interest. The Stony Nakoda Nation says the panel did not properly assess the impact that rejecting Benga Mining's proposed Grassy Mountain project would have on Aboriginal and treaty rights and economic interests related to the accommodation of those rights. The Pikani First Nation filed a similar request last week, as did Benga Mining. Alberta is giving up to $150 million to provide reliable broadband internet coverage to more rural, remote and Indigenous communities. Premier Jason Kenney says Alberta was once a national leader in rural broadband, but 80% of First Nations and 67% of rural areas still don't have reliable access. A ground-penetrating radar search is set to take place over the weekend at an old cemetery site on a reserve in northern Saskatchewan. The search is taking place where Lac La Ronge Indian Residential School once stood. The school was operated by the Anglican Church of Canada from 1907 to 1947. Lac La Ronge Indian Band Chief Tammy Cook Searson says it took crews three weeks to clean up the cemetery for ground-penetrating radar. Throughout the years, she says it became overgrown, covering some of the two stones marking where children were buried. A growing number of wildfires and increasing smoke are forcing the evacuation of another Indigenous community in Manitoba. The Canadian Red Cross says it is helping individuals with health concerns from Red Sucker Lake First Nation, about 700 kilometres northeast of Winnipeg. It is the fifth Manitoba First Nation whose members have been forced to leave their homes this week. Iqaluit's elders' home is still empty more than two months after its residents were evacuated from the facility when a staff member tested positive for COVID-19. Four of the home's six elders were sent to a seniors' living residence in Ottawa, while two more were sent to elsewhere in the territory. The nonprofit that ran the home quit and cited frustrations with the government of Nunavut's operations following the closure. Ontario's opposition New Democrats say Premier Doug Ford needs to stop ignoring the wildfire crisis in the province's northwest. In an open letter, two NDP legislators who represent northwestern communities asked the Premier to declare a state of emergency. There are currently 166 fires burning in northwestern Ontario, 83 of which are out of control, and five First Nations have been evacuated. A nearly $3 million home in Gatna, Quebec, has been ordered to be demolished after a Quebec Superior Court judge ruled that it had been built too close to the road in violation of local bylaws. Neighbours complained about the property and the judge ruled that even if it was a good faith error on part of the city, the infringements detailed by the neighbours were too serious to let stand. Gatna has 30 days to decide whether to appeal and the homeowner is separately suing the city for $3.6 million. 
Meanwhile, a Quebec mayor says public health officials need to send a clearer message about the benefits of being vaccinated against COVID-19. Jonathan V. Bolduc, mayor of St. Victor and prefect of Robert Cliché, says low vaccination rates in Quebec's Beauce region south of Quebec City may be explained by confusion and mistrust caused by the health department's messaging. Mr. Bolduc says mixed messaging about masks at the beginning of the pandemic and changing guidance about the interval between doses of COVID-19 vaccines have diminished trust in a region where many people are skeptical of government. A woman who was briefly a liberal candidate in the Nova Scotia election says the party asked her to lie about why she dropped out and cite mental health concerns. Robin Ingraham said Wednesday in a social media post that the real reason she was dropped in the riding of Dartmouth South was because of revealing photos she had posted in the past, photos she said she had disclosed to the party. She has written to liberal leader Ian Rankin saying the party made a mistake by forcing her out. All right, stay with us as we take a look at what's making news around the world after the break. Software company Kaseya restores its security after a massive cyber attack. Meanwhile, U.S. fire crews make progress against the nation's largest wildfire and landslides and flooding hit western India. We'll have these stories and more news from around the world coming up after the break on the Forum Daily. So stay tuned. Just some short messages coming up after the break. We'll be right back. Well, there's some good news from the Florida company whose software was exploited in a massive 4th of July cyber attack. Kaseya says it now has a universal key to unlock the data of more than 1,000 businesses and public groups that were affected by the global attack. A spokeswoman for Kaseya isn't saying how the key was obtained, but says it is now being distributed to all victims of the attack. Crews are making progress against the nation's largest wildfire in Oregon, even as fires in neighboring California continue to threaten homes. The bootleg fire, which has destroyed an area half the size of Rhode Island, is 40 percent surrounded after burning 70 homes. In California, blowing embers from the Tamarack Fire south of Lake Tahoe ignited a fast-moving spot fire, prompting a new evacuation near Topaz Lake on the California-Nevada line. The British government has announced plans for daily COVID-19 testing of critical food industry workers, allowing those who test negative to continue working even after they have been in close contact with people infected with the virus. The government said on Thursday night that it has identified priority locations, including the largest supermarket distribution centers, where testing will begin this week. The program will be expanded to as many as 500 sites next week. Germany's national railway operator has estimated that last week's flooding caused 1.3 billion euros or around 1.5 billion dollars worth of damage to its network. Authorities are still working to determine the overall cost of the floods that did their worst damage in western Germany and eastern Belgium. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said this week that the damage is immense and will take a long time to repair. Over 200 people died in Germany and Belgium as a result of the flooding. A government official says landslides triggered by heavy monsoon rains hit parts of western India, killing at least 32 people and leading to the overnight rescue of more than 1,000 other people who were trapped by floodwaters. The victims were killed in three landslides on Thursday in Raigad district in western Maharashtra st state. Many of those rescued were stranded on rooftops and even on top of buses on highways. The official said the rains had slowed and water levels were coming down on Friday. Thousands of Eritreans, refugees, are increasingly caught in the middle of the conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region. Witnesses and UN officials say forces have attacked their camps, abducted or killed some of their residents, and stolen their food and possessions. The refugees are among the most vulnerable groups in the Tigray conflict, which erupted in November with thousands of casualties. The refugees say they have been targeted by Eritrean troops and Tigrayan forces. While Tigray forces have denied targeting Eritrean refugees, Eritrea's information ministry did not respond to questions. A new study suggests that a Sinopharm vaccine offers poor protection from COVID-19 among the elderly. A survey of blood samples taken from 450 people in Hungary at least two weeks after their second Sinopharm dose found that 90 percent under 50 years old have developed protective antibodies. But the percentage declined with age and 50 percent of those over 80 had none. 
The study by two Hungarian researchers was posted online this week, but has not yet been reviewed by other scientists. Three outside experts said they had no problems with the methodology of the study. Thailand's already locked down capital of Bangkok shut down the few remaining public places to residents on Friday. The near total restriction on movement came after people with COVID-19 were found dead on the streets of Bangkok. A government COVID-19 response official said nearly 4,000 COVID-19 patients were in intensive care units on Friday, including 900 on ventilators. Meanwhile, more than 20,000 people in the Bangkok region were waiting on COVID-19 treatment beds. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has made a rare visit to Tibet. State media say President Xi visited sites in the capital, Lhasa, including the former palace that was home to the Dalai Lamas, Tibet's traditional leaders. China increased controls over Buddhist monasteries in recent years and expanded education in the Chinese rather than Tibetan language. Critics are routinely detained and can receive long prison terms. This is especially true if they have been convicted of association with the Dalai Lama, who lives in exile in India. The spokesman for the Afghan Taliban says the insurgents don't want to monopolize power. But he says there won't be peace in Afghanistan until there is a new negotiated government in Kabul and President Ashraf Ghani is removed from office. Suhail Shaheen, who is also a member of the Taliban's negotiating team, told the AP that under the Taliban, women will be allowed to work, go to school and participate in politics, but they will have to wear the hijab or headscarf. Well, sulfur-crested cockatoos in Sydney have learned to open trash bins and the technique is catching on like a hot dance move. Scientists analyzed videos of 160 birds lifting lids as well as the geographic spread of the skill to conclude that most birds learned by watching others. And that'll do it for your look at international and national news for today. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time.